policy. Um, yesterday, I, I did a video that I entitled Pedophiles Vote Republican. This title, by the way, is in response to the QAnon theory that there's a huge cabal of, of pedophiles uh, who are Democrats. Undoubtedly, there are Democratic people who have sexually molested children. Um, but the idea that there is a huge conspiracy that reaches all the way up to the level of government that is covering this up and actually nurturing it and that these are Democrats is entirely false. And I do have evidence of this, unlike QAnon, which just moves by rumor. Uh, if such a uh, cabal exists, they are Republican. And um, before you get angry with me, I'm going to discuss the evidence that I have. I spent 13 years documenting clergy sexual abuse of children in fundamentalist churches. And then that kind of tipped over towards the last five years into the Southern Baptist Convention. So first, just real quickly, um, based on my research, I researched 108 cases that I documented. There were actually probably about a dozen more that I, I just believed weren't suitable for documentation. But in the end, I wrote a book on how it is done, like the mechanics of how churches are doing this and how they're getting away with it. And that book is called Schizophrenic Christianity. And then I actually compiled a book of evidence, the big book of bad Baptist preachers. And that includes both the indep independent fundamental Baptists, I think a couple other fundamentalist churches and Southern Baptist churches. Um, so some people I think mis misheard, or maybe I wasn't clear enough yesterday thinking that I'm saying, only right-wing people are molesting children. No, that is not true. Child molesting can occur between in two to four percent of the population. That is two to four percent of people will molest children. Um, it's hard to define the spread beyond that because so much is is not documented. Nobody goes to the police what researchers believe is most child molesting occurs within families. So you're not going to see like a religious component to that or a, a political component or a racial component. It's occurring in families. Where we're seeing a conspiracy of a cover-up though is definitely in right-wing churches. And, and yes, I do have, you know, 13 years of experience. That's a lot of experience. And I can definitely say it's happening in these churches, in the 108 uh, churches where I documented this, not one church did the right thing. Not one church came out in favor of the child. Um, very often you'd have six-year-old, nine-year-old child blamed for being promiscuous. And of course, you know, this ramped up as the child got older. I saw it more in cases where the child was 12, 13, 14 years old. Like, like somehow this adult pastor who has a family and is married, he could not protect himself from the wiles of a 13 year old. Um, so the, but the, cons the idea of the conspiracy is that these churches do, do not and will not and refuse to enact any measure of accountability. So, um, the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest religious denomination in the United States, they have been besieged, shamed, entreated, had lawsuits trying to coerce them to put in a database of offenders just so that offenders could be tracked and be kept out of Southern Baptist churches. And I'm not talking about members of churches. I'm talking about the actual pastors and church officers. That is where great deal of child molesting is going on in the Southern Baptist Convention and in fundamentalism, particularly the independent fundamental Baptists. So I, I want to, um, oh, also these churches won't institute a grievance process. Now, you know, some people have gotten upset and have said that in their local church, there is a grievance process. They actually have enacted certain rules for child protection, but it ends at the local church. And to that, I do want to say to these well-meaning people, you frankly don't know what is going on behind the scenes if there's no grievance policy that goes beyond your church. Because what I learned in a lot of these churches, and we saw this in Jack Scott, 
uh, the First Baptist Church of Hammond, where he molested a teenage girl, that, that actually the deacons came together and expelled the girl and her family. And the reason they expelled her simply was that she had been molested by the pastor. So you don't, you know, and, and there was, there's a code of silence that comes down in these churches. People are, some of them just kind of catch the drift from the culture. They're not going to talk about it if they hear about it. It gets whispered about and murmured about in bathrooms, but nobody comes out and says it. If anybody does come out and says it, then you have a sermon that's preached against gossip. But what, what does the scripture tell us? You know, in, in Acts chapter 6, we see a group of people who were disenfranchised in the early Christian church who begin to murmur about suffering injustices at the hands of the, the ruling party of the church, and that would be the Greek Jewish widows. The Greek Jews were looked down upon by the, um, the Jewish Jews, uh, the Jews who lived in Israel and, and um, other parts of the Roman Empire, because these more conventional, traditional Jews were still keeping the law, whereas the Hellenized Jews or the Greek Jews were viewed as having given in and they were accepting elements of Greek culture. So they were sort of always the second class citizens in Judaism, although they would come up to Jerusalem when they could to, to sacrifice at least once in a lifetime. They tried to do that, many of them. So when this happened around the resurrection of Christ and you have a large portion of the early church, which was entirely Jewish at first, you had these Greek Jews the widows had no means of support, and we sort of see that stream of that idea stream through the New Testament. This comes up a couple of times about the plight of the widows and the church caring for them. And they perceived that they were being left out of the distribution of charity. And they murmured to the to the men who were local to them. And these men went then to the the elders, the apostles and the elders, and they complained about this. And what we see here is a right to appeal to the very highest authority, which the elders and apostles yielded to. They came out, they addressed the issue, they solved it transparently by having the Greeks appoint the first deacons. So there's no shadow then of favoritism. The first deacons of the Christian church were Greek Jews, and that solved the situation. We also see in Acts chapter 15, we have the council at Jerusalem. So, so Paul's going out with Barnabas and then later Silas, and, and they are evangelizing across the churches. We see in books like Galatians and First and Second Corinthians that Paul had authority over these churches, and yet he has to come back to Jerusalem and make a report to the council. And we actually do see in Acts chapter 15, when they settled the matter about Gentiles coming into the Christian church, they made the decision and then they sent out envoys to tell all the churches that this is the way that it would be. Church government is not local only. Church government is hierarchical and it goes all the way up to a governing council that is representative of the churches. And that ensures that the least important person in any local church can enter an appeal and an entreaty all the way up to the top. And procedurally, that is guaranteed to every member of the church. And that is how you have a just church. And if that sounds a little familiar to you, it should, because our American system of, of government and the courts is actually based on that. It literally is based off the New Testament procedures, but that's a discussion for a different time. The Southern Baptist Convention was founded specific, specifically and shamelessly to permit church members to own slaves and engage in the commerce of human beings without facing any Christian accountability. That was the reason that the Southern Baptist Convention slid off from the American Baptists and formed their own convention, and they structured it so that local churches were not accountable to anybody and anybody could do anything. And that is why black Christians have absolutely no rights, even through segregation, even after the end of the Civil War, the Southern Baptist Convention, and I know this angers many Southern Baptists, they were angry enough with me yesterday, they're gonna be more angry today, is a church founded in slavery. And it maintained a false code of righteousness, which I'll talk about a little bit. 
in order to get away with and acquit themselves of the gross sins of owning slaves and selling human beings and doing anything they liked to those human beings without, without anybody in Christendom calling them to account for it. That is where the Southern Baptist Convention comes from. The Independent Fundamental Baptists largely split off from the Southern Baptist Convention because believe it or not, they were even crazier than the Southern Baptist Convention and wanted more latitude in independence. And so we have the Independent Fundamental Baptists. How do these people do what they do? Uh, um, I'm a graduate of Bob Jones University. I was a fundamentalist. I professed Christ as Savior when I was 14 years old. I got kicked out of a Catholic school. I started attending a very good uh, independent Baptist church called Ben Salem Baptist Church. At the time, my guess, it wasn't known around the nation, but from other churches I've seen, I think Ben Salem Baptist was probably one of the best churches in the United States of America, but it still suffered from the problems of its radical independence. But I, I was Baptist uh, and I was a fundamentalist and I went to Bob Jones University and I graduated in good standing there. Uh, I taught as a graduate assistant there for two years and for three years I was on staff at Bob Jones University Press. Um, I was on the reading textbook group working on that and also headed up the early stages of their Christian novel division. So I'm well grounded in fundamentalism. I know whereof I speak. So how how well first let me say fundamentalism and the southern baptist convention evangelicalism has radically sidetracked christianity christianity is about loving your neighbor forgiving your enemies doing good to the oppressed and the suffering how how has it gotten so sidetracked how is it that we were seeing crosses and the name of christ at this horrible insurrection at the capitol and the first thing and i said this yesterday when things get tough, you bring up the Satan puppet. You start warning all your followers about this huge, towering evil of Satan. Satan is evil, and he is a towering evil, but Satan has been utterly defeated by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what I noticed, um, especially like later, after I had stopped because of PTSD and health issues, I, I stopped documenting cases. But later, reporters started picking this up. CNN, uh, around 2011, I think, uh, 2011, 2012, they did a series. And then Sarah Smith uh, in the Star-Telegram did a very extensive series on the Independent Fundamental Baptists and their sexual abuse. And then more recently, the Houston Chronicle has done a series on Southern Baptist clergy sex abuse of children. So there is evidence. These places are citing cases. On my web page, my blog at jerryhu.net, I have still got my evidence up there, my cases and a table of, it's called the roll call of shame. And you can find that. So when these, when these cases would become too popular, sooner or later you have the IFD, the SBC, they pull out the Satan pulpit, say, Jerry Massey drinks beer, she drinks alcohol, you can't listen to her. I'm talking about pastors who are raping children, and there were some egregious, I mean, incredible cases. Trinity Baptist in Jacksonville, Florida, where the deacons actually fed church children to the pastor, Bob Gray, over a 20-year period. Yes, that really happened. Um, to First Baptist Church of Hammond, which created the college, Hiles Anderson College, more child abusers have come out of Hiles Anderson College, honestly, this tiny college, than you would see come out of the entire history of huge schools like UCLA. You look at the, the number of men, and these are people who face legal charges. It doesn't include those who didn't. Just, just I think we're over two dozen now, and this is supposed to be like a seminary, okay? So when you get too close to them, they would start, you know, you can always pull out Satan to distract people from your own sins. Start talking about how evil Halloween is, that's the biggie, how evil Santa Claus is, how satanic Scooby-Doo is, how satanic yoga is. There's all kinds of things that you can say are satanic, especially when you're pushing a counterfeit of Christianity. What is satanic? What pleases Satan the most? Undoubtedly, pastors molesting children in the name of Christ. You can't get more satanic than that, but that is not what these churches are talking about when they pull out the Satan puppet. And then what else do they have? Oh, the 
rapture puppet. We've got the rapture puppet. We can pull up, you know, the rapture. The world's going to end. There's probably about five different theories about the rapture and the end times and how it's all going to happen. But one thing in common for all of them is when your church and your leaders have engaged in something truly despicable, just say, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. When you don't want your people to have to face up to what they are and what they have done, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Or you can always say we're not as bad as the gays because that works too. So these two items, the, Satan, this towering evil, the towering mysterious evil, and then this cataclysmic end, this apocryphal ending, these are two big weapons in the religious right, which has now extended into right-wing politics. QAnon is using this in a slightly modified form. They have this unspeakably evil group, which, you know, they say are Democrats who are all molesting children. You know, remarkably, we're not seeing any survivors here. I mean, I can point to survivors, uh, people, people who as children were sexually molested by pastors. I can identify, I mean, I wouldn't unless they gave me permission, but there's all kinds of them. And yet these are the people who spoke to Sarah Smith and who talked to the Houston Chronicle and got on CNN and said, yes, I was sexually abused. And now we also have medical records for some of this. So there's evidence here. But when you're talking about this mysterious Democrat cadre of child molesters, strangely, there's no survivors to say I was molested by these people. We're, so are these people also serial killers? In which case, where in the world are the bodies? Where are the parents who are saying what happened to my child? She was hanging around with Democrats and suddenly disappeared. We don't have anything like that. And the other thing that they have, which they have dressed up as this great revolution, is this apocalyptic ending as Donald Trump saves America from these child molesters. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, except it is all made up. And yet, right-wing people believe it. And why do they believe it? Because they were trained to believe it in the religious right, because the religious right extends this mythology. And again, I say this, I am a Bible-believing Christian who is trying to serve the Lord in good conscience. Yes, I believe the Bible. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ died and literally rose again in his body for the remission of my sins. That matters to me incredibly. And I am so sorry to see the faith of Jesus Christ carried away captive by these people. So I hope that this clarifies it for everybody what I am trying to say. And I'm probably going to say some more. And I thank you for listening. Thank you very much for listening. And um, I'll look forward to see your comments um, uh, when you post them. Thank you.